It's Thursday morning outside the county courthouse in Kaufman, Texas, when a man can be heard screaming for his life in the parking lot. Saying, please no, please don't, please no. And then the shots started. Five shots ring out in broad daylight. Attorney Jenny Parks was heading into the courthouse. I was scheduled to be in criminal court that morning, so I'd parked across the street at the annex and was walking across. You saw your friend and colleague laying there after being shot? Yes. What goes through your mind? What adrenaline? What fears? What questions? Just hoping that Mark's OK. Jenny's friend Mark is Mark Hassey, Kaufman County's assistant district attorney. Everybody in the Dallas legal community knew Mark Hassey. He had a big reputation. A police dash cam catches the chaos. There you go, buddy. Keep breathing for me. Mark is now barely clinging to life, his body riddled with five bullets. Keep on the go, go, go. He was a very prolific trial lawyer and had been a very successful prosecutor in Dallas for many years. The assistant DA is rushed to the hospital. Tragically, it's too late. Mark Hassey is dead. And Mark's boss tells the killer to watch out. He's coming for him. I hope that the people that did this are watching because we're very confident that we're going to find you. We're going to pull you out of whatever hole you're in. And we're going to bring you back and let the people of Coffin County prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. The Kaufman County Sheriff says this was no random shooting. Hassey was targeted, but by whom? When a prosecutor is murdered, you have no shortage of suspects. Every person that's been put away by that prosecutor or been prosecuted becomes suspect number one. Try 25 years worth of suspects, including violent murderers and drug dealers. And now, with many of them out of jail, investigators wonder if one of them could be looking to settle a score. He respected the fact that some of the people that he had tried during the years were serious criminals and knew that there were people he had prosecuted that might want to come after him. He, he, he carried a gun. And Mark Hassey was armed when he was shot to death. Tragically, his gun was under his buttoned up jacket and he didn't have time to pull it out before he was ambushed. You never think that a prosecutor leaving his car or walking into the office is going to be gunned down. After firing the fatal shots, the shooter and his getaway driver raced from the scene. But this happened in broad daylight, and there were witnesses. There was a, a woman attorney who was driving up who saw the whole thing happen. There was also a uh, mechanic across the street who watched from behind the door at the auto paint shop. The getaway car is described as an older model brown or silver sedan missing a license plate. Unfortunately, no one got a good look at the two suspects. They tell cops the driver was too far away, and the gunman? Was wearing a hood, kind of like an executioner's hood from a game, black mesh in the front. Because Mark was a close friend of District Attorney Mike McClellan, special prosecutors are brought in from the county over to oversee the investigation. Bill Worski is one of the special prosecutors assigned to the case. Just thought it was a relatively, while violent and bloody case, it was a relatively simple case. And seemingly very personal, the killer looked Mark dead in the eyes when he pulled the trigger. But who could harbor so much hate? While investigators track down possible suspects, there's breaking news about another member of law enforcement being gunned down in Colorado. There was a uh, prison warden in Colorado that had been murdered at his home uh, by a white supremacist, and that person fled down to Texas. Could these two shootings be connected? Just a little more than 100 miles from Kaufman County, a deputy with his dash cam rolling corners the suspect in the Colorado murder. Evan Ebel, a recent parolee and white supremacist, is sitting behind the wheel in the black Cadillac. He's got a pistol in his lap, laying in wait, with his finger on the trigger as the deputy approaches the car. Monte County Sheriff's Deputy James Boyd is shot three times. Though gravely wounded, he will survive. As for Ebel... 
He races off, leading deputies on a wild high-speed chase that comes to a crashing end when his black Cadillac smashes into a semi. Evil's still alive inside that mangled mess of metal and exchanging gunfire before deputies finally take him out. Oh, shot fired, he's down. Copy, shots fired, suspect down. The murderer of that warden in Colorado, an attempted murderer of Deputy James Boyd, is dead. But did he also gun down Mark Hassey? Or is there another killer on the loose? Assistant District Attorney Mark Hassey is gunned down outside the Kaufman County Courthouse. This killer was capable of anything. Of anything. Totally unpredictable. Around the same time, parolee Evan Ebel murders a Colorado prison warden and severely wounds a Texas deputy. Ebel is killed in a shootout with cops. But authorities wonder if there's a connection to Mark Hassey's murder. Anything is within the realm of possibility. But it turns out Ebel wasn't even in the state of Texas when Mark was killed. So if he didn't kill Mark Hassey, who did? The first thing you think is there's somebody that I prosecuted that wants to get me. But you also have to look, is there something in the personal life? Is there something that we're missing? So it was look at things personally, business, and professionally. And so the investigation was cranked up. Local officials did that investigation, but unfortunately, the trail ran cold. Ice cold for weeks, but the murder of the assistant DA is never far from anyone's mind, especially those working at the courthouse. Was there a sense that the DA's office was targeted considering the suspect was still out there? Was that in the air? Absolutely. Who's mad? Who's ticked off that wants to take down the Kaufman district attorney's office? Everybody took it very seriously and changed their security habits and very, very scared at different points during this case. It was a shared sentiment reaching the very top. District Attorney Mike McClelland even went gun shopping for his office to make sure that all of his employees were armed and ready just in case. He took care of everybody. He was there for the entire office. He was the boss and he was the leader, more of a, a papa bear type boss. A gun owner and enthusiast, McClellan was thought of as a tough guy who could take care of himself, according to his son, J.R. He uh, kind of felt himself as, as, as pretty invincible. He had, a, he had a weapon on him at all times. He taught us how to use a gun. He uh, never locked his doors. He, uh, he was tall and carried a big gun. And kept several other guns all over the home he shared with his wife, Cynthia. Two by the chair, two on the bar, two on the entertainment center, one on each side of the bed. They were cool. Tragically, that wasn't enough to protect the popular district attorney or his wife. They were ambushed in the pre-dawn hours at their own home. And about two months after Mark was murdered, Mike McClellan, the DA of Kaufman County, and his wife, Cynthia, were found murdered in their home in Kaufman County. The shocking murders came on the Saturday before Easter. Sheriff deputies respond now on high alert. I got in the car and went out to the crime scene, but the entire way there, we're trying to locate other members of the Kaufman DA's office, because at that point, we didn't know how many prosecutors had been killed. Special Prosecutor Bill Worski, brought in to investigate Mark Hassey's murder, quickly gets word that the other Kaufman prosecutors are accounted for and safe, at least for now. It was completely unprecedented to have two prosecutors from the same office murdered. And what's more? It was an unprecedented assault on the criminal justice system so because only prosecutors and their families are being targeted and murdered. Kaufman County Sheriff's homicide detectives record the gruesome crime scene. It's a virtual bloodbath inside the home. DA McClellan's body is found by the front door, and his wife Cynthia is nearly naked and lifeless on the living room floor. Both shot multiple times with an assault style weapon. And you just kind of go numb. Uh, you really don't know what to think. 
Cops collect evidence at the crime scene, but they have very little to go on except for a few neighbors who report seeing a white Crown Victoria car in the McClellan neighborhood before and after the shooting. Then Kaufman investigators face the solemn task of notifying the McClellan children. What were your thoughts and your feelings when you found out your father was dead? Initially, I, I didn't believe it. He, he was invincible. JR had to break the tragic news to his sister. I actually thought my brother was lying to me. You were in disbelief. Right. But sadly, it's true, and now Kaufman authorities race to protect their own. There was a concerted war on prosecutors. In an unprecedented move, the Sheriff's Department gives prosecutors and their families round the clock armed protection. We were just worried that our friends were going to get, you know, murdered. They all had officers assigned to their houses. It was terrifying, you know, thinking about another friend could get murdered. Then a bizarre break in the case nobody saw coming. Just 24 hours after D.A. McClelland and his wife are gunned down, an anonymous tip comes into the Kaufman Sheriff's Crime Stoppers hotline. And this tip isn't coming from just any caller. It's the killer himself. He was proving that it was him by giving little details about the weapons used, the bullets used, how the killings had taken place. So this Crime Stoppers caller had information that no one would know except the murder. Yeah. And then, in a chilling email exchange with officers through the Crime Stoppers website, this same person threatens to commit more murders unless a Kaufman judge resigns. The terrorizing tipster writes, you have until Friday at 4 p.m. It all seemed very well calculated. But when detectives attempt to trace the killer's email address... We were unable to successfully trace that IP address back to the killer. It turns out he had used the Tor network through the dark web to access the website. And he, in a sense, was taunting us online. But detectives believe they might already know the man behind the twisted emails. After Mark was murdered, and then after Mike and Cynthia was murdered, he became the one and only common denominator. Mark and Mike only tried one case together, and that was the case where they prosecuted Three people have been murdered in Kaufman County, Texas. It's kind of like the Wild West out there. The district attorney, Mike McClelland, his wife, Cynthia, and the assistant DA, Mark Cassie. The only prosecutors and their families are being targeted and murdered. And now authorities believe they know who pulled the trigger. And it's the most unlikely of suspects. His name is Eric Williams, and it wasn't just his friendly baby face that made him a surprising person of interest. The married 46-year-old was a former National Guardsman and one-time member of the Kaufman County Chamber of Commerce. And that's not all. He was a justice of the peace in town. That's right. The man cops suspect just murdered three people was also a Kaufman County judge and a rising star in the legal community. He had gone from being the main CPS attorney in Kaufman to winning, winning the uh, JP's position. And it came with power. He had a bright future. Had being the operative word. But that all changes when courthouse surveillance video surfaces starring the high-ranking and highly respected Justice of the Peace. On the surveillance video, Eric was seen walking out of the IT department carrying Dell computer and monitors. Uh, he removed three of them on a Sunday afternoon when the building was closed. Were there charges that were filed against him? He was arrested on theft charges. Felony theft charges. Who prosecuted this case? Mark Cassie prosecuted this case, and Mike McClellan was second chair. Eric Williams pleads not guilty. He's offered a plea deal reducing the charges from a felony to a misdemeanor. He refused it. He thought he could talk his way through it. Just listen to him try during this police interrogation. I don't think that you actually believe, I mean, you're an educated person. Mm -hmm. I see you flash a ring on your finger, uh, that you can just walk into a the ID department and say, I need a monitor, I'm taking that one. I mean, there's places that do that. Places being here in Coleman County or, well, I mean, there's businesses that, yeah. I think he felt justified because, you know, he was trying to put that video surveillance system 
in at the courthouse to be able to use to do magistrations. And he was taking the monitors for that, or that was his defense. A defense the jury doesn't buy. Eric is found guilty and gets two years probation. But since Eric has been convicted of a felony, he automatically loses his justice of the peace position and law license. Over $600 worth of computer equipment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In essence, he loses everything, and detectives believe that is his motive for the murders. I think it was just revenge. It was that simple. He wanted to take the lives of the two prosecutors that had prosecuted him. I believe in his mind, he wanted to take the lives of the people that had taken his life. He had decided that he was entitled to this revenge, and everybody else was just collateral damage. But not everyone is convinced of Eric's guilt. I thought he was a thoughtful, considerate, kind, caring person. Attorney Jenny Parks worked with Eric over the years and thought highly of the justice of the peace. Did you feel like you were the lone voice in support of Eric Williams diffusing these rumors? No, there were several people that thought Eric was innocent. I wasn't the only one in this county. There were several attorneys that didn't want to believe it. But there were plenty of people who believed Eric was capable of murder. That animosity that built up during the trial. The theft case had been so personal in that kind of incubator of that little courthouse in that little town that there so much hate had built up. But there's just one problem concerning Eric as the prime suspect. There's not a stitch of evidence tying him to the triple murder investigation. And Eric is refusing to talk to investigators. We were trying to get an interview with him. However, his lawyers at the time prevented that. Then detectives catch a break. We have evidence from video cameras in the neighborhood that showed that white Crown Victoria, a typical police car, uh, going into the neighborhood right before the murders and leaving the neighborhood right after the murders. It's the same car neighbors reported seeing on the morning the McClellans were gunned down. And even though the video is too grainy to make out the driver or passengers inside the vehicle. We knew then and there we had our man and had the right person. But there is no record of Eric owning this type of vehicle. And you'll remember the getaway car used in Mark Hassey's murder was described as a brown or silver sedan. But those seemingly contradicting facts don't dissuade investigators. They thought that he had things stashed somewhere, but uh, they just didn't know where it was. Then, in a strange turn of events, detectives actually receive word from Eric. 12 days after the murders, his, he fired his lawyers, and he actually wanted to talk with us in the investigation. Right away, two Texas Rangers head out to Eric's home. They make an audio recording of the conversation. And you understand why your name pops up in Absolutely. All this? Absolutely. Did you have anything to do with it? No, absolutely not. Then they ask Eric how many guns he has in his home. You don't have any more? You I got rid of all of them? I have one gun I'm trying to sell, and it's just hard as hell to sell. Hey, just curious, how many guns did you used to own? About 16. And you sold 15 of them? As a convicted felon, he's no longer allowed to own guns. I'd love to go back and say, there's no guns in the house. We looked in the house. I guess we could just look in there real quick. They didn't have probable cause for a search warrant, so they needed Eric to say, OK, you can come in, you can search my house. And he did that that day. He let them in. But you don't mind us going out and looking? I'll, okay. I'll take over. And once inside, cops can't believe what they find. Eric Williams' Little House of Horrors. Authorities in Kaufman County, Texas, believe their own justice of the peace is a triple murderer. Eric Williams would stop at nothing until he got his revenge. Cops claim Williams got his revenge by killing District Attorney Mike McClelland, his wife Cynthia, and Assistant DA Mark Hassey after they prosecuted and convicted him of stealing $600 worth of computer monitors. That conviction cost Williams his judgeship. Pretty much lost everything over it. The not-so-peaceful former justice is the prime suspect, but cops say they have no evidence tying him to the murders. And Eric Williams is not talking to police, but he is talking to the press. First, I want to say that uh, my deepest condolences go out to the uh, 
my own family and all the people at the courthouse, most of which I know. Um, I've cooperated with law enforcement. I certainly wish them the best in bringing justice for this uh, just incredibly egregious act. Then, in a bizarre turn of events, Williams fires his attorneys and says he will talk to investigators. He thought he was smarter than his lawyers. And it's the age old added, you know, a lawyer that represents himself as a fool for a client. At that point, uh, the Texas Ranger and one, somebody from the high up in the Sheriff's Department went over and knocked on Eric's door. To their surprise, Williams invites them inside. The investigators record the conversation. Hey, Eric, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. They enter with caution. After all, they consider Eric to be a cold-blooded killer with a chip on his shoulder the size of Texas against Kaufman County law enforcement. Do you still have any ammo or anything? Last year, uh, the only ammo I would have would be for that uh, when Williams was found guilty of stealing those computer monitors, he became a convicted felon. He wasn't allowed to have firearms. During the recorded conversation, Eric tells authorities he sold all of his 16 guns except one. But when investigators move into the next room, they discover parts of guns everywhere. Hey, Eric, I'm just curious. You're selling all your guns. Why didn't you say you're spotting some and stuff? Then they find something else. It's not a taser, it's a heat seeker, a tool with a built in laser used to detect heat sources. It's normally used for hunting game at night, but investigators think Eric planned to use it to hunt humans, or he already did. District Attorney Mike McClelland and his wife were gunned down before dawn. Investigators have seen enough. They had enough evidence to get a search warrant, and that was the first big break. The very next day, Kaufman County investigators return, and they bring back up the FBI, and they go through every square inch of Williams' home. And that's when they found a lot of the really damaging information. Inside a filing cabinet, investigators discover the title to a white Crown Victoria vehicle in Eric's name. The same type of car spotted in the McClellan's neighborhood around the time of the murders. It had been purchased just weeks before, and that's not all. The smoking gun was he had actually logged on to a Crime Stoppers site and claimed credit for the murders. Now, obviously, he did this anonymously. But when we conducted a search of his house, he had written down the password for the login to Crime Stoppers. And each tipster gets a unique password. And when cops cross check that code, it links directly back to those taunting emails from the killer. So we knew instantly that Eric Williams was the person that had been taunting us through the Crime Stoppers tip line. Wow, it's the little things. It's the little things that always get them. Agents arrest Williams for making deadly threats, but there's still not enough evidence to charge him with the murders. And while they found the title to that mysterious white crown Vic, they still can't locate the car. The investigators knew they were looking for the car. They thought that he had things stashed somewhere. And one of the places they thought of was a storage unit, but uh, they just didn't know where it was. And in this small town, feds searching the home of the former justice of the peace becomes the lead story all over the news. That prompts one viewer to call police. He's a friend of Eric's. After he saw media coverage, I think the friend knew by that point that we were on to Eric Williams, and the friend thought he better tell us what he knew. Before he got embroiled in the whole triple murder. That's exactly right. Eric's friend tells police about a secret storage unit that he rented in his name for the former Justice of the Peace. Kaufman officials get a second search warrant and race to the address of the storage unit. Once the door was raised, we found a veritable treasure trove of evidence, including the White Crown Victoria. The storage locker I've heard referred to as Eric Williams' Little House of Horrors. It was packed with ammunition, different types of guns. Over 70 guns are recovered, from handguns to assault rifles and everything in between. It was amazing what they found inside. Such as? Oh, they found napalm. 
They found jars of napalm. Uh, they found a crossbow with arrows. They found what looked like a Molotov cocktail that they think that he might have been pulling together to burn up the car when he was done with it. But what about that other getaway car used during the murder of prosecutor Mark Hassey? It was described as a brown or silver sedan. Well, turns out investigators find receipts that show Eric recently purchased a silver Mercury Sable. He thought it was nondescript and no one would notice it. And it had also been in the storage unit, but broke down in the parking lot where it was towed away. We had a mountain of evidence. And that mountain is about to come crashing down on Eric Williams. He's arrested for capital murder in the shooting deaths of Assistant DA Mark Hassey, District Attorney Mike McClelland, and his wife Cynthia. But turns out this former judge, hell-bent on revenge, wasn't killing alone. He had some help. When Kim Williams came out of the holdover to testify against her husband, you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. It's an arsenal of hate and death from a man who used to be justice of the peace in Kaufman County, Texas. Literally in the courtroom, we had a mountain of evidence. Eric Williams' secret stockpile of terror. And you recognize this as a, uh, a lower unit to an AR type rifle? Yes. Assault rifles, handguns, a crossbow, even napalm. We had over 70 weapons uh, that came into evidence to show what type of person Eric Williams really was. Hidden in a storage unit now paraded in front of a jury. I ask you if you recognize this as one of the weapons that was uh, found in the storage unit. Yes. As a Rock River Arms uh, lower with an AR-57 caliber upper attached. Yes. But Williams' most terrifying weapon? You were a murderer. Yes. His wife and partner in crime, Kim. You are Kim Williams? Yes, I am. The wife of Eric Williams? Yes. Are you guilty of these capital murders? Yes, I am. When Kim Williams came out of the holdover to testify against her husband, uh, you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. And she very quickly gave the jurors a glimpse into their murderous life and the planning, the meticulous planning that went on behind these murders and how they were carried out. The lethal lovebirds both charged with capital murder. Uh, she was a full participant in these murders, and although she didn't actually pull the trigger, she was there every step of the way. She helped. She was there with logistical support. She was there with moral support. Kim Williams cut a deal with prosecutors for a 40-year prison sentence. Then on the witness stand, she hammers nail after nail into her husband's coffin. Describing in detail what Williams wore when he assassinated Assistant District Attorney Mark Hassey. Tell the members of the jury about that. He had a uh, Halloween uh, mask and he had on a black nylon jacket, some pretty dark khaki pants. I believe he was wearing his uh, bulletproof vest underneath the jacket. And he was wearing his glasses underneath the, the hood. Ms. Williams. Let me show you state's exhibit number 417 and ask you if you recognize that. Yes. What is that? That's the mask he wore. How do you know? I recognize it. Testifying to her husband's rage toward the district attorney and assistant DA after being convicted of stealing $600 worth of computer parts, Kim telling the jury that was Eric's motivation for the murders. In the days following his conviction, how was his anger towards Mark Hassey? Pretty bad. How about Mike McClellan? Bad. You got angrier and angrier? Yes. They embarked on this joint uh, trail of vengeance and murder. Kim Williams admitted in open court she drove the getaway car for Eric when he gunned down assistant DA Mark Hassey. Did you agree to drive? Yes, I did. You knew what was going to happen? Yes, I did. Why did you agree to drive to the murder of Mark Hassey? I was so drugged up and I so believed in Eric and everything that he told me. His anger was my anger. Testifying he was almost giddy that murderous morning. Did he have a specific name, or how did he refer to the plan in the parking lot? Tombstone. Tell the members of the jury what Tombstone means. Tombstone is a movie uh, where they shoot people in the street. 
But that former justice of the peace wasn't done killing. Who was next on the hit list? That would be Mike McClellan. The Kaufman County District Attorney who worked with Mark Hassey to convict Eric Williams. Kim also confessed she was behind the wheel of that white crown Victoria when her husband ambushed McClelland and his wife Cynthia, slaughtering them in their home in pre-dawn hours. What did he tell you about how Cynthia McClelland died? He told me that he had to shoot her an extra time because she was still moaning. Then Kim sends a shiver down jurors' spines when she makes this chilling revelation. Tell the members of the jury about the cookout y'all had. We had uh, barbecue steaks. Well, we had steaks on the grill, and Eric cooked those. They celebrated by eating steaks after the murders to celebrate the deaths of the McClellans. Even after killing McClelland and Hassey, Kim testified her husband still had a thirst for blood, claiming he actually made a hit list. After the McClellans were killed, were there more on the hit list? Yes. Who was that? Early Wiley. Believe it or not, Early Wiley is the new district attorney who took over after Mike McClelland was murdered. Could you tell us your name, please? My name is Early Norvell Wiley. And how are you, Floyd? I am the district attorney in Kaufman County, Texas. Why did Williams want her dead? Turns out she was working as a judge and had caught Williams overbilling when he was a court-appointed attorney. That was before he was a judge in Justice of the Peace and before he was busted stealing computer parts. After taking over those duties, uh, did you uh, look at some of the uh, problems or potential problems you thought uh, might have occurred with some billing and with certain lawyers? Yes. Were some of those cases involving Eric Williams? Yes, many of the cases involving the attorney at Lytle work representing the children did involve Mr. Williams. Williams was reprimanded, and that apparently was enough to put a target on the new DA's back. When you found out about this hit list mm. and that your name was on it, what went through your mind and how shocking was that? To know that someone by the time I found out, had killed three people, and he had me on a hit list. Probably more than any of the other things, it was the most unsettling. And he was in custody. But to know, because what I knew was that he would have killed me and my family. Because if he killed Mike and Cynthia in their home, and Cynthia did nothing, he would have killed me and my family for what he believed was a perceived wrong. How high did the hairs on your neck stand when you find out you were next? Pretty high, pretty unbelievable. And while District Attorney Wiley may have been next, there was someone after her on Eric Williams' hit list. And who else? Judge Ashworth. Shockingly, Judge Glenn Ashworth was considered a longtime friend of Eric Williams, but the former Justice of the Peace believed Judge Ashworth is the one who leaked information that led to his conviction for stealing computer equipment. And Kim testifies her husband had something extra terrifying in mind for him that involved that crossbow and napalm. How did he tell you he was going to kill Judge Ashworth? He was going to wait until after Super Bowl and he was going to wait for him and uh, shoot him with the crossbow and then bore his stomach out and put the napalm in it. Remember, this is the same man who once tried to offer comfort to the victims. First, I want to say that uh, my deepest condolences go out to the McClellan family and all the people at the courthouse, most of which I know. Uh, I've cooperated with law enforcement I certainly wish them the best in bringing justice for this uh, just incredibly egregious act. The gall, he was sending out condolences and uh, his emotions and heartfeltness to the family. I think they call that a sociopath, right? Right. Somebody, a psychopath. Somebody that, that has no remorse or compassion for people. It doesn't take long for the jury to reach a verdict. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Eric Lyle Williams, guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment. 
Guilty of capital murder, Eric Williams is sentenced to death by lethal injection. The son of former DA Mike McClellan, J.R. McClellan, says he'll be the one eating steak that night. We're gonna buy fake tapes, fake glass of sweet tea. Putting your hands on him crossed your mind. Yes, ma'am. But it wasn't worth ruining my life. And prosecutors believe they stopped what they call a cold and calculated killing machine just in the nick of time. Had you not cracked this case and apprehended Eric Williams, would you have had other bodies on your hands? Oh, I think so. I don't think the killings would have stopped unless we stopped Eric Williams. One day after she was indicted, Kim Williams filed for divorce. She says she believes her husband had a plan to kill her and himself when he was done taking out all the people on his hit list. Eric Williams appealed his conviction. That appeal has been denied.